<sighs> Godzilla vs. Kong turns two today. It is the second anniversary from the release of Godzilla vs. Kong, which feels illegal to say. Just for a minute, imagine. People born on the day Godzilla vs. Kong came out are walking and talking now. How horrible is that? Time goes by way too fast, and I'm an old man, and I'm turning to dust. I could see it happening in front of me. To celebrate the second anniversary of Godzilla vs. Kong, it's time to give you guys a blast from the past. That's right, today we're going to be reviewing the Godzilla vs. Kong novelization, but as you'll quickly realize, this video was recorded a very long time ago. It was recorded and supposed to be uploaded in between my spoiler-free and my spoiler review for Godzilla vs. Kong. It was originally recorded on June 10th, 2021, and just due to the way that school really honestly shaped my life, I wasn't able to edit or upload this video until now, but I figured it would be a fun way to celebrate the release of Godzilla vs. Kong by reviewing the novelization for the movie. It's kind of like I get to do another review all over again. Pretty fun. Alright guys, I hope you enjoy the video. I will see you guys next time. What's up everybody, d man back. Welcome to a brand new video and today we're going to be doing another Godzilla vs. Kong review. <laughs> Today we will be sitting down to review the Godzilla vs. Kong novelization released by Titan Books, a friend of the channel. Now I will say this video is not sponsored by Titan Books. They sent me this one. They did not send me this one. I didn't ask, to be fair. But I have here in my hand the Godzilla vs. Kong novelization. First of all, I, I really like how small they are. They're just a nice size. They're not like bigger books. They're just a nice size. The text is readable. You can read. It's like a decent sized text. They're nice. I actually really, really prefer these types of books. They're just super convenient. You can really take them anywhere you want and they're really nice. The Godzilla vs. Kong novelization was written by Greg Keyes, the author of the Godzilla King of the Monsters novelization. It was released by Titan Books in 2021 alongside Godzilla vs. Kong theatrically. Its US price is about $8.99 as it states on the back. I think I paid a little more because I ordered it online. But it's about $8.99 US. So that's actually cheaper than a ticket to see the movie and it's like cheaper than a DVD to see the movie. It's like 10 bucks. So you're actually getting more Godzilla vs. Kong for less. It's 21 chapters and 311 pages. There's also an audiobook version of this narrated by Richard Farron, which runs for 10 hours and 31 minutes on Audible. Did I already say it was on Audible? Maybe I said that twice. I got that one as well. So not only do I own it, but I could listen to it whenever I wanted, and that was super nice. I really like Richard Farron's narration. I think he has a really good voice. He does kind of impressions for each character. It's really nice. Sometimes I'm thrown off because the inflection of the line is different from the movie, so he'll read it differently than how the actor says it in the film. That's not his fault. I don't think they actually get to see the movies before they do these audiobooks, but it just is something that would stick out to me. Anytime they would have a discrepancy in the way he would read the line versus the way the actor read the line, I'd be like, whoa, that's weird. But I really like his narration. I love his style, and I, I've enjoyed listening to both audiobooks he's done for the MonsterVerse. I wish he would go back and do the Godzilla 2014 and Kong Skull Island novel novelizations as well. As for the plot of Godzilla vs. Kong, I'm gonna still try and keep it generally spoiler free, so don't worry about spoilers here. Godzilla attacks an Apex facility in Florida. In response, the CEO of the company contracts Nathan Lynch to venture into the Hollow Earth so he can find a power source capable of operating a weapon that can compete with Godzilla. To accomplish that mission, Nathan joins with Monarch and convinces them to take Kong off of his dying island and into the Hollow Earth so he can retrieve the power source. During this mission, an ancient Kong conflict is reignited as Godzilla and Kong face off as the last remnants of a forgotten war. The novelization follows the same general plot structure of the film, with two plots, Team Kong and Team Godzilla, that run separate from each other. Unlike the film, the novelization fleshes out two subplots and gives them a lot of time to develop. So, in addition to Team Kong and Team Godzilla, there's Team Apex and Team Monarch. I had a lot of reactions to this book. You'll hear me talk about it a lot. I want to do some videos talking about the differences between the book and the movie. I think that'll be a lot of fun. Fun, so I'll do that over time as well, but just for now, here's my general reactions. This is a much deeper dive into the world of Godzilla vs. Kong. Generally, for those of you who don't know the way novelizations work, they're generally accepted as canon. Basically, anything in these that doesn't contradict the films is canon. That's the way it works. So, if there's like a line discrepancy between the line somebody says in the book or the line they say in the movie, the one they say in the movie is the canon version. If there's a discrepancy between this thing happens in the movie but it doesn't happen in the book, well, 
it's still canon. The thing that happened in the movie is canon. Or if something happens in the book that contradicts the movies, it's not canon. That's the way it works. This book dives into a lot of stuff that wasn't seen before, and again, it's generally canon, and it's generally appreciated. Sometimes it's like, we didn't need to go here, but we went there anyways, but we'll get there later. Everything with Mark Russell is very welcome, and the fleshing out of Ren Serizawa's story is great. Ren's story is fascinating because he's a hero fighting for a justified cause against the protagonists. He's actually really selfless and tragic, and I very much enjoyed his character. I'll talk a little bit more about Mark and Ren when we get into the character section, but those were the two biggest impressions this novelization made on me. Sometimes the book ventures into territory that isn't exactly necessary. There are times when there are scenes that are extended when they don't really need to be. For instance, Nathan Lind explains on multiple occasions in this book how Kong's homing instinct works. We get it the first time he says it. It's clearly stated to Sarazawa and Simmons, we get the idea. But then he takes the time to explain it to Maya as well, and he explains it to Eileen, and we don't really need him to do that. And it's like the same explanation each time, it's like a full explanation, It's we don't need it. We got it the first time. This book feels like the true sequel to Godzilla King of the Monsters, and it gives much more time and weight to their turning characters. One of the things that struck me about the film Godzilla vs. Kong is that it feels a little disconnected from King of the Monsters. Like, yes, Mark and Madison are there, but it doesn't have the same feel. Monarch isn't as big of a presence. Madison has a very different vibe in the movie. This novelization sets everything straight. It gives Mark the time he deserves, and it fleshes out Madison in the way you expect. Madison and Mark are both fully realized characters, and they carry their presence from the last films with them, and I actually like both of these characters better than I do in the film. Because this book is written by Greg Keyes, it flows so well with the Godzilla King of the Monsters novelizations. These two books feel like they are one story that run together in some sort of parallel expansion to the MonsterVerse. It feels like an alternate extended version of the films we know. The notes at the top of each chapter tie the whole world together and also connect this book to the last. It's a really cool touch. I'm a big fan of it. Like each chapter starts with like notes from some other person in the MonsterVerse. So Dr. Ling, Dr. Chen, Houston Brooks, various characters we've met. Rick Stanton gets a shout out. That's fun. And these notes tie together all sorts of real world and fictional ancient mythologies together to weave the story of the ancient war for Godzilla and Kong. In this case, in the Godzilla King of the Monsters novelization, it's a little more weaving together the story of the Titans. The style of this book is pretty good. I like it. I know some people aren't as into it, but I'm a fan. He sort of emulates the vernacular of the characters he's writing about. So when he's writing from Gia's perspective, the world is more natural and Andrews is called mother. When we're talking about Madison's perspective, Mark is called dad. When we're viewing the world through Nathan's perspective. It's a little more loose with the way it's told. It's a little more loose form than everyone else is. We get words like crap thrown in, I guess as an example, it would be like, oh crap, when it's told from Nathan's perspective. Whereas if it was told from somebody else's perspective, they would have used a different word choice. And I think that's really cool. We also get time from the Kaiju's perspective. Godzilla's is a little more abstract, same as it was in King of the Monsters novelization. Kong's is a little more primitive. And by that, I mean, it's not like Ooga Booga talk, you know, it's not like caveman talk, but it's just the way it refers to things are all from the first person and all all looking out he's not really comprehending the things the way that we would so it's kind of told the way Kong would see the world all about like I and you it's just told differently I can't really describe it without you actually reading it but it's just told differently I like it whereas when it's told from Godzilla's perspective it's a little more like that comic book Godzilla Dominion if you've read that where it's kind of told in a little bit more of an abstract way that refers to Godzilla as a deity going through the characters the characters are all very very much expanded from the way they were in the film, and it's very appreciated. Nathan Lind has a much more defined story arc. He feels like a failure, and he's a bit of a coward at the start. He is indecisive and horrible under pressure, but he learns how to take lead and act as a hero. By the end, he is responsible and brave. There are times where the book goes a little too hard on Lind, in my opinion. As he's watching Godzilla and Kong fight on the ships, for instance, he's really torn a new one by the book. It really stresses how much of a loser he is, and you get inside of his own perspective, and he tears himself down as well. Well, but everybody kind of is super judgmental towards him, and I don't think it's exactly justified. Now, I'm only going to be talking about characters who there was a massive change with. Ellie and Andrews is pretty much the exact same character. There's nothing really different with her. We do get to spend more time with her, but it doesn't really flesh out any new insights into her character. Gia is a little different. She has a lot more to say in the novelization, but in my opinion, not all of it is as welcome. Sometimes she has a bit of an attitude, and it just kind of comes across as more like something Madison would say than Gia herself 
herself. She's just kind of a little snarky towards her mother or Andrews, and it just doesn't really sit right with me. G is supposed to be the sweetest person on earth, but she doesn't always come across that way in the novelization. There are times where the expansion of this character is very welcome. The book explores the disconnect between the Iwi and foreign cultures. I really like that. Gia's connection to nature and lack of awareness of the outside world is super interesting, and it takes us to very cool places to explore. I really like her first impressions of the world. Maya Simmons is kind of different. She has just as much attitude as she does in the film, but it's balanced out against some modesty and humanization. She works much better in the book than she does in the film, and she seems more real to me. The only time where I didn't enjoy the addition to her character is when we get it explained that she really doesn't care about anything and she's only helping because she wants to take over her father's empire. I would have preferred her to have different motivations than that. That's a little too selfish and greedy. I guess it's kind of in line with how unlikable she comes across in the film, but it's not as interesting as if maybe she didn't like Godzilla and so she was helping because she didn't like him. Madison Russell. This is the same character we met in Godzilla King of the Monsters. She carries around the weight of the last film and she's similarly intelligent to how she was in the last movie. The movie Godzilla vs. Kong kind of sticks out to me as being weird. I talked about it in my review, but Madison seems off. She seems mischaracterized in the film. Well, the book fixes that. The book underlines her motivation and provides much needed context into Madison's actions. It makes her more likable than the film. She's smarter and more aware than she is in the film, and she doesn't come across as as much of a crazy conspiracy theorist. It's made a point that she doesn't really buy into the majority of Bernie's theories. Interestingly, it's also kind of made a point that Bernie doesn't really buy into many of his theories either. I like this much better than when she kind of comes across as an insane crackpot in the movie and it makes her kind of seem like an idiot that she would buy into like, oh, there's chemicals in the water, you know? <laughs> there's a subplot about how Madison is still haunted by Ghidorah in the events of 2019. She's also desperate to help stop Apex because she needs to rid herself of guilt and justify Godzilla's existence. There's no orca for her to steal this time, so stopping Apex is all she has. Bernie and Josh, I'm not a big fan of the way they're portrayed in the book. These two are kind of misunderstood. Alone, each character is fine. Bernie is much more grounded than he is in the film. There's a lot of backstory and context provided to his character, and it's all great. Josh is pretty much identical to how he was in the movie. However, he's a bit more of a coward outright. Where these two characters have a problem is whenever they start to interact. In the film, I kind of get the impression that Team Godzilla really grows to like each other, and by the end of the film, they're all friends, even though they're kind of yelling at each other when the world is getting destroyed by Mechagodzilla. It's more of like they're all just scared. In the novelization, Bernie and Josh never really like each other. Their lighthearted banter does not seem lighthearted. They're a little meaner. Both characters are more confrontational towards each other. Maybe it's just the way I was interpreting it, but they just didn't seem like they liked each other at all in the book and I prefer them to kind of be like awkward buddies. Walter Simmons. He's the only character who I outright like the film version more in every way. Walter is way more evil and cynical in the book than he is in the film. He does not seem justified in his actions at all. It, it turns him into much more of a generic bad guy than he even is in the movie. Although he does have some fun scenes where he's very charismatic and there's some good moments with that. But overall, they kind of just turn him into like, I'm greedy and want to take over the world. And he's a little bit more of a mustache twirling villain. Whereas in the film, you kind of just get the idea that he's like, I really don't like monsters, so I'm gonna kill them all. Ren Serizawa, he's an actual character now. It's great. Motivated less so by his father's death and more so by Godzilla's history of destruction, Ren is a very complex and interesting character. He's one I want to talk a lot more about in future videos. His motivations are justified and understandable. His backstory provides new context and new light into the Serizawa family name. He looks at his family in a completely different way than the comic books in the previous movies do. It's actually a refreshing take on the family. I like it. It kind of calls into question a lot of the loyalties we have to Sarazawa in the previous films. I also like that he wasn't just a generic Godzilla killed my dad and so now I need to stop Godzilla and he also wasn't quite the my dad spent too much time studying Godzilla and not enough time hanging out with me. There is an element to that and they even make a point that Ren is self-aware about how cliche that is but also Ren's much more motivated by the fact that giant monsters are destroying humans at massive rates and by keeping Godzilla around it's this massive unknown variable that we just need to get rid of. We need to get rid of him so he can never come and stop us. Because without Mechagodzilla, there's no way to stop him. So what if he did turn evil? There would be no failsafe against him. Ren is also kind of really selfless. He's just kind of a hero. He doesn't need credit in the public eye. He's not trying to prove anything to anybody but himself. He's just trying to protect the world. He doesn't care if anybody ever finds out that he's the one who kills Godzilla. I really like it. Then finally we have Mark Russell. He's back. It's the same Mark Russell. Mark 
Clark feels just the same way as when we last left him. In the movie, he comes across as very strange. He's like, writes Godzilla off immediately. Like, whatever, monsters like people can change and Godzilla's evil now. The novelization really helps us understand that not even Mark believes that. <laughs> he's just kind of saying that to get Madison out of the area. He's super analytical and he's always on top of what's happening. He has this very involved subplot in the first half of the book. It's very heavily developed, but it takes a bit more of a backseat as the story goes on. But every edition with Mark is great. I thought all of it was fantastic. It's all much more of the monarch I'm used to, and I think it would have helped the film. It certainly would have helped the character in the film. I guess pacing-wise, probably they made the right call to cut all this stuff, but it would help Mark Russell as a character. Now on to Godzilla himself. Godzilla is presented as being a divine god. He's presented the exact same way as he is in all the complementary material to the films. He feels much more like the Godzilla from the expanded canon than he does the Godzilla from the movies, and that's not a bad thing. That just means we get a little bit more understanding of him. He only seems to take exception when fighting Kong. That's the only time he ever seems to take pleasure in anything. It's this war with Kong. It's the only time he has ranged emotions. Other than that, I mean, yes, he has like rage and anger and also he, he has an instinct to protect the earth and keep balance, but he's not really a complexly emotioned character until he's fighting Kong and then he kind of takes enjoyment in it and he's kind of fighting for something other than the protection of earth. It's the only time he's ever doing anything for himself. Kong is pretty much the exact same as he is in the movie. The book jumps into his head a few times and we see the confusion and betrayal he feels in the early parts of the story and we also feel that trust build with humanity over the course of the film. He's almost more intelligent in the book than he is in the movie or at least they make a point of how smart he is many more times in the book than they do in the movie. I really like Kong in this book. The action is a little awkward. It's really hard to write action scenes like the ones in the movie and I have a feeling that these novelizations are written before anybody gets to see the movie. So I think Greg Keyes is writing based on what the script says the fight scenes are going to be. I imagine that's incredibly hard for him to do because the action scenes are very brief in the book. They're super brief. Specifically, the fights between Godzilla and Kong in Hong Kong, they are very fast. If this is how you plan on experiencing the fight, you're doing it wrong. Watch the movie because the fights are not fleshed out the way they are in the film. You don't even get to experience them the same way. The action scenes are often told from other people's perspectives, which is super different. Round one is told almost completely from the perspective of Nathan Lind. It almost never leaves the inside of the ship with him. Round two is told from Mark Russell's perspective up on the hill in Hong Kong, and round three is told once again from Nathan Lind's perspective. Then round four, which is the post-fight fight, the one that I'm not going to spoil, that one's kind of split up between Nathan, Mark, and Madison. Mostly Madison, though. As for the new additions, that's what everybody comes to the novelizations for. They're looking for the new additions to the material. This is an extended version of Godzilla vs. Kong, and so the film's lightning pacing is lost. It takes until chapter 6, or page 80, or 2 hours and 33 minutes into the audiobook for Bernie to start his podcast outside of Apex Facility. So it takes about two and a half hours for the film to really start, which just gives an indication of how much they added. And it's kind of that way the whole way through. It becomes more and more and more like the movie until the very end. By the end of the book, it's pretty much following the movie exactly. And so there's no new additions from Hong Kong on. But before that, very different. Not all of the additions feel needed, I will say. Sometimes we cut to the perspective of like a park ranger or a soldier we don't know. And these moments don't really always justify their existence. Although they are nice to flesh out the broader world of the monsterverse, moments like these show that there are people living inside this universe other than the ones we meet in the films, but they don't exactly justify their existence. It feels like all the add-ons in the Godzilla King of the Monsters novelization needed to be there. Like they all feel like they are part of this grand story that we needed to be informed of because they have something to say. Whereas in this Godzilla vs. Kong novelization, feels like for the most part, whenever we're cutting to a character other than the ones we know in the movies, it's not always needed. Some of the dialogue is changed or extended from how it is in the movie and lots of scenes are extended. This seems to have been written based on a previous version of the script. However, if you're hoping that this is going to be the true definitive extended edition of Godzilla vs. Kong, I guess technically as far as canon is concerned, it is, but it's not everything that we know they filmed. There was a lot filmed for this movie that doesn't make it into either the film or novelization, such as Madison getting bullied at school, there's a scene of Madison and Josh passing notes, these are gone, a lot of Nathan's backstory is here, but it's different than the way it was filmed, so there's some differences here. It's not a full picture of what was lost from the movie. If that's what you were hoping for, that's not what we get. There's some Mark Russell stuff that's also missing from this that was shot for the movie but also cut. So this gives us a better idea of what they were looking at to do, but not a clear picture of all the stuff they were gonna do. It's also hard to say what was gonna be filmed for the movie and used in the 
original cut because a lot of the stuff from the novelization is specifically added for the novelization. So it gets very muddy. Who knows? Overall, I'd say this was pretty good. I didn't think this novelization was as good as the one for Godzilla King of the Monsters. Again, that one feels like you needed to read that. It's not like you lost anything by just watching the movies, but you gained so much more from reading the book. Godzilla vs. Kong, the novelization, if there's a way to cut out just the Ren and Mark parts and then you read all that, that feels like you're pretty much getting exactly what you needed to get in the movie but didn't, whereas everything else is kind of better in the movie. So I'd say in an instance like this, I do prefer the film's version of the story. However, again, I really, really do like that stuff with Mark and Ren. That is great. Overall, I'd say this is a pretty fun and interesting dive into the deeper world of Godzilla vs. Kong. If you're looking for an extended version of that story that fleshes out the human side of things and not necessarily the monster stuff, this is your place. Again, for the millionth time, the extension of Mark and Ren's stories really sell the book for me, and I hope it sells it to all of you too. Overall, I'd give the Godzilla vs. Kong novelization by Greg Keyes and released by Titan Books, <laughs> I'd give it an 8 out of 10. So I didn't like it as much as I liked the movie, but I do like it quite a bit. Immediately after finishing that novelization, I jumped straight back into the Godzilla King of the Monsters novelization, and I can't wait to talk more about that as well. So if you like this stuff about the extended monster verse and <laughs> the novelizations, stick around, because I'll definitely do more content relating to that. If you want to see videos early or interact on the Discord with me and a few others, which is really great, go check out that Patreon link down below. It goes towards supporting the channel, and I really, really appreciate all of that. Keeps these videos possible so that I can keep making these and I don't have to abandon my channel full time so I can go get a job. So thank you all to my patrons on Patreon. I really appreciate you guys. And thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I will see you guys next time for the next one. D-Man out.